Chapter 16 Cell Communication Individual cells, like multicellular organisms, need to sense and respond to their environment. A free living cell, even a human, a, even a humble bacterium, must be able to track down nutrients, tell the difference between light and dark, and avoid poisons and predators. And if such a cell is to have any kind of social life, it must be able to communicate with other cells. When a yeast cell is ready to mate, for example, it secretes a small protein called a mating factor. Yeast cells of the opposite sex detect this chemical mating call and respond by halting their progress through the cell division cycle and reaching out toward the cell that emitted the signal. Figure 16.1 In a multicellular organism, things are much more complicated. Cells must interpret the multitude of signals they receive from other cells to help coordinate their behaviors. During animal development, for example, cells in the embryo exchange signals to determine which specialized role each cell will adopt, what position it will occupy in the animal, and whether it will survive, divide, or die. Later in life, a large variety of signals coordinate the animal's growth and its day-to-day -day physiology and behavior. In plants, as well, cells are in constant communication with one another. These cell-cell interactions allow a plant to respond to the conditions of light, dark, and temperature that guide the cycles of growth, flowering, and fruiting. They also allow the plant to coordinate what happens in its roots, stems, and leaves. In this chapter, we examine some of the most important methods by which cells communicate, and we discuss how cells send signals and interpret the signals they receive. Although we concentrate on the mechanisms of signal reception and interpretation in animal cells, we also present a brief review of what is known about cell-to-cell -cell signaling in plants. We begin our discussion with an overview of the general principles of cell signaling and then consider two of the main systems animal cells use to receive and interpret signals. General Principles of Cell Signaling Information can come in a variety of forms, and communication frequently involves converting the signals that carry information from one form to another. When you receive a call from a friend on your mobile phone, for instance, the phone converts the radio signals which travel through the air into sound waves which you hear. This process of conversion is called signal transduction, figure 16.2. The signals that pass between living cells are simpler than the sorts of messages that humans ordinarily exchange. In a typical communication between cells, the signaling cell produces a particular type of signal molecule that is detected by the target cell. As in human conversation, most animal cells both send and receive signals, and they can therefore act as both signaling cells and target cells. Target cells possess receptor proteins that recognize and respond specifically to the signal molecule. Signal transduction begins when the receptor protein on a target cell receives an incoming extracellular signal and converts it to the intracellular signals that alter cell behavior. Most of this chapter is concerned with signal reception and transduction. The events that cell biologists have in mind when they refer to cell signaling. First, however, we look briefly at the different types of signals that cells send to one another. Signals can act over a long or short range. Cells in multicellular organisms use hundreds of kinds of extracellular molecules to send signals to one another. The signal molecules can be proteins, peptides, amino acids, nucleotides, steroids, fatty acid derivatives, or even dissolved gases. But they rely on only a handful of basic styles of communication for getting the message across. In multicellular organisms, the most public style of communication involves broadcasting the signal throughout the whole body by secreting it into the bloodstream in an animal or the sap in a plant. 
Signal molecules used in this way are called hormones, and in animals, the cells that produce hormones are called endocrine cells. Figure 16.3a. Part of the pancreas, for example, is an endocrine gland that produces the hormone insulin, which regulates glucose uptake in cells all over the body. Somewhat less public is the process known as paracrine signaling. In this case, rather than entering the bloodstream, the signal molecule diffused locally through the extracellular fluid, remaining in the neighborhood of the cell that secretes them. Thus, they act as local mediators on nearby cells. Figure 16.3b Many of the signal molecules that regulate inflammation at the site of an infection or that control cell proliferation in a healing wound function in this way. In some cases, cells can respond to the local mediators that they themselves produce, a form of paracrine communication called autocrine signaling. Cancer cells sometimes promote their own survival or proliferation in this way. Neuronal signaling is a third form of cell communication. Like endocrine cells, nerve cells, neurons, can deliver messages over long distances. In the case of neuronal signaling, however, a message is not broadcast widely, but is instead delivered quickly and specifically to individual target cells through private lines. As described in Chapter 12, the axon of a neuron terminates at specialized junctions, synapses, on target cells that can lie far from the neuronal cell body. Figure 6, 3, 16.3c The axons that extend from the spinal cord to the big toe, for example, can be more than one meter in length. When activated by signals from the environment or from other nerve cells, a neuron sends electrical impulses racing along its axon at speeds of up to 100 meters per second. On reaching the axon terminal, these electrical signals are converted into a chemical form. Each electrical impulse stimulates the nerve terminal to release a pulse of an extracellular signal molecule called a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter then diffuses across the narrow, less than 100 nanometer gap between the axon terminal membrane and the membrane of the target cell, reaching the target cell receptors in less than one millisecond. A fourth style of signal-mediated cell-cell communication, the most intimate and short range of all, does not require the release of a secreted molecule. Instead, the cells make direct physical contact through signal molecules lodged in the plasma membrane of the signaling cell and receptor proteins embedded in the plasma membrane of the target cell. Figure 16.3d During embryonic development, for example, such contact-dependent signaling allows adjacent cells that are initially similar to become specialized to form different cell types. Figure 16.4 To relate these different signaling styles, Imagine trying to advertise a potentially stimulating lecture, or a concert, or a football game. An endocrine signal would be akin to broadcasting the information over a radio station. A localized paracrine signal would be the equivalent of posting a flyer on selected notice boards. Neuronal signals, long distance but personal, would be similar to a phone call or an email and the contact-depending signaling would be like a good old-fashioned face-to-face conversation. In autocrine signaling, you might write a note to remind yourself to attend. Table 16.1 lists some examples of hormones, local mediators, neurotransmitters, and contact-dependent signal molecules. The action of several of these is discussed in more detail later in the chapter. Each cell responds to a limited set of signals, depending on its history and its current state. A typical cell in a multicellular organism is exposed to hundreds of different signal molecules in its environment. These may be free in the extracellular fluid, embedded in the extracellular matrix in which most cells reside, or bound to the surface of neighboring cells. Each cell must respond selectively to this mixture of signals. 
disregarding some and reacting to others, according to the cell's specialized function. Whether a cell responds to a signal molecule depends first of all on whether it possesses a receptor protein or receptor for that signal. Each receptor is usually activated by only one type of signal. Without the appropriate receptor, a cell will be deaf to the signal and will not respond to it. By producing only a limited set of receptors out of the thousands that are possible, a cell restricts the types of signals that can affect it. Of course, a small number of extracellular signal molecules can change the behavior of a target cell in a large variety of ways. They can alter the cell's shape, movement, metabolism, gene expression, or some combination of these. As we will see, the signal from a cell surface receptor is generally conveyed into the target cell interior via a set of intracellular signaling molecules, which act in sequence and ultimately alter the activity of effector proteins, which then affect the behavior of the cell. This intracellular relay system and the intracellular effector proteins on which it acts vary from one type of specialized cell to another, so that different types of cells respond to the same signal in different ways. For example, when a heart muscle cell is exposed to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, the rate and force of its contractions decrease. When a salivary gland is exposed to the same signal, it secretes components of saliva, even though the receptors are the same on both cell types. In skeletal muscle, acetylcholine causes the cells to contract by binding to a different receptor protein. Figure 16.5. Thus, the extracellular signal molecule alone is not the message. The information conveyed by the signal depends on how the target cell receives and interprets the signal. A typical cell possesses many sorts of receptors, each present in tens of hundreds tens to hundreds of thousands of copies. Such variety makes the cell simultaneously sensitive to many different extracellular signals and allows a relatively small number of signal molecules used in different combinations to exert subtle and complex control over cell behavior. Such combinations of signals can evoke responses that are different from the sum of the effects that each signal would trigger on its own. This is partly because the intracellular relay systems activated by the different signals can interact, so that the presence of one signal can modify the responses to another. One combination of signals might enable a cell to survive, another might drive it to differentiate in some specialized way, and another might cause it to divide. In the absence of any signals, most animal cells are programmed to kill themselves. Figure 16.6 a cell's response to a signal can be fast or slow. The length of time a cell takes to respond to an extracellular signal can vary greatly, depending on what needs to happen once the message has been received. Some extracellular signals act swiftly. Acetylcholine can stimulate skeletal muscle contraction within milliseconds and salivary gland secretion within a minute or so. Such rapid response is possible because in these cases, the signal affects the activity of proteins and other molecules that are already present inside the target cell, awaiting their marching orders. Other responses take more time. Cell growth and cell division, when triggered by the appropriate signal molecules, can take hours to execute. This is because the, the response to these extracellular signals requires changes in gene expression and the production of new proteins. Figure 16.7 We will encounter additional examples of both fast and slow responses and the signal molecules that stimulate them later in the chapter. Some hormones cross the plasma membrane and bind to intracellular receptors. Extracellular signal molecules generally fall into two classes. The first and largest class consists of molecules that are too large or too hydrophilic to cross the plasma membrane of the target cell. 
They rely on receptors on the surface of the target cell to relay their message across the membrane. Figure 16.8a. The second and smaller class of signals consists of molecules that are small enough or hydrophobic enough to slip easily across the plasma membrane. Once inside, these signal molecules usually activate intracellular enzymes or bind to intracellular receptor proteins that regulate gene expression. Figure 16.8b. One important class of signal molecules that rely on intracellular receptor proteins is the steroid hormones, including cortisol, estradiol, and testosterone, and the thyroid hormones, such as thyroxine. Figure 69. All of these hydrophobic molecules pass through the plasma membrane of the target cell and bind to receptor proteins located in either the cytosol or the nucleus. Both the cytosolic and nuclear receptors are referred to as nuclear receptors because, when activated by hormone binding, they act as transcription regulators in the nucleus, discussed in Chapter 8. In unstimulated cells, nuclear receptors are typically present in an inactive form. When a hormone binds, the receptor undergoes a large conformational change that activates the protein allowing it to promote or inhibit the transcription of specific target genes. Figure 16.10 Each hormone binds to a different receptor protein, and each receptor acts at a different set of regulatory sites in DNA, discussed in Chapter 8. Moreover, a given hormone usually regulates different sets of genes in different cell types thereby evoking different physiological responses in different types of target cells. Nuclear receptors and the hormones that activate them play an essential role in human physiology. See Table 16.1, page 535. Loss of these signaling systems can have dramatic consequences as illustrated by what happens in individuals who lack the receptor for the male sex hormone testosterone. Testosterone in humans shapes the formation of the external genitalia and influences brain development in the fetus. At puberty, the hormone triggers the development of male secondary sexual characteristics. Some very rare individuals are genetically male, that is, they have both an X and a Y chromosome, but lack the testosterone receptor as a result of a mutation in the corresponding gene. Thus, they make testosterone, but their cells cannot respond to it. As a result, these individuals develop as females, which is the path that sexual and brain development would take if no male or female hormones were produced. Such a sex reversal demonstrates the crucial role of the testosterone receptor in sexual development, and it also shows that the receptor is required not just in one cell type to mediate one effect of testosterone, but in many cell types to help produce the whole range of features that distinguish men from women. Some dissolved gases cross the plasma membrane and activate intracellular enzymes directly. Steroid hormones and thyroid hormones are not the only extracellular signal molecules that can pass through the plasma membrane. Some dissolved gases can slip across the membrane to the cell interior and directly regulate the activity of specific intracellular proteins. This direct approach allows such signals to alter a cell within a few seconds or minutes. Nitric oxide, NO, acts in this way. This gas diffuses readily out of the cell that generates it and enters neighboring cells. NO is synthesized from the amino acid arginine and operates as a local mediator in many tissues. The gas acts only locally because it is quickly converted to nitrates and nitrites, with a half-life of about 5 to 10 seconds, by reaction with oxygen and water outside cells. Endothelial cells, the flattened cells that line every blood vessel, release NO in response to stimulation by nerve endings. This NO signal causes smooth muscle cells in the vessel wall to relax, 
allowing the vessel to dilate so that blood flows through it more freely. Figure 1611. The effect of NO on blood vessels accounts for the action of nitroglycerin, which has been used for almost 100 years to treat patients with angina, pain caused by inadequate blood flow to the heart muscle. In the body, nitroglycerin is converted to NO, which rapidly relaxes blood vessels, thereby reducing the workload on the heart and decreasing the muscle's need for oxygen-rich blood. Many nerve cells use NO to signal neighboring cells. NO released by nerve terminals in the penis, for instance, triggers the local blood vessel dilation that is responsible for penile erection. Inside many target cells, NO binds to and activates the enzyme guanylocyclase, stimulating the formation of cyclic GMP from the nucleotide GTP. See figure 1611C. Cyclic GMP is itself a small intracellular signaling molecule that forms the next link in the NO signaling chain that leads to the cell's ultimate response. The impotence drug Viagra enhances penile erection by blocking the enzyme that degrades cyclic GMP, prolonging the NO signal. Cyclic GMP is very similar in its structure and mechanism of action to cyclic AMP, a much more commonly used intracellular messenger molecule that we discuss later. Cell surface receptors relay extracellular signals via intracellular signaling pathways. In contrast to NO and the steroid and thyroid hormones, the vast majority of signal molecules are too large or hydrophilic to cross the plasma membrane of the target cell. These proteins, peptides, and small, highly water-soluble molecules bind to the cell surface receptor proteins that span the plasma membrane. See figure 16a These transmembrane receptors detect a signal on the outside and relay the message in a new form across the membrane into the interior of the cell. The receptor protein performs the primary signal transduction step. It binds to the extracellular signal and generates new intracellular signals in response. See figure 16.2b. The resulting intracellular signaling process usually works like a molecular relay race in which the message is passed downstream from one intracellular signaling molecule to another, each activating or generating the next signaling molecule in the pathway until a metabolic enzyme is kicked into action. The cytoskeleton is tweaked into a new configuration, or a gene is switched on or off. This final outcome is called the response of the cell. Figure 1612. The components of these intracellular signaling pathways perform one or more crucial functions. Figure 1613. 1. They can simply relay the signal onward and thereby help spread it through the cell. 2. They can amplify the signal received, making it stronger, so that a few extracellular signal molecules are enough to evoke a large intracellular response. 3. They can receive signals from more than one intracellular signaling pathway and integrate them before relaying a signal onward. 4. They can distribute the signal to more than one signaling pathway or effector protein, creating branches in the information flow diagram and evoking a complex response. As part of the integration function, many steps in a signaling pathway are open to modulation by other factors, including both intracellular and extracellular factors so that the effects of each signal are tailored to the conditions prevailing inside and outside the cell. Some intracellular signaling proteins act as molecular switches. Many of the key intracellular signaling proteins behave as molecular switches. Receipt of a signal causes them to toggle from an inactive to an active state. Once activated, these proteins can turn on other proteins in the signaling pathway. 
They then persist in an active state until some other process switches them off again. The importance of the switching off process is often underappreciated. If a signaling pathway is to recover after transmitting a signal and make itself ready to transmit another, every activated protein in the pathway must be reset to its original unstimulated state. Thus, for every activation step along the pathway, there has to be an inactivation path mechanism. The two are equally important for the signaling process. Proteins that act as molecular switches fall mostly into one of two classes. The first and by far the largest class consists of proteins that are activated or inactivated by phosphorylation, a chemical modification discussed in Chapter 4. See Figure 438. For these molecules, the switch is thrown in one direction by a protein kinase, which tacks a phosphate group onto the switch protein, and in the other direction by a protein phosphatase, which plucks the phosphate off again. Figure 1614a. The activity of any protein that is regulated by phosphorylation depends, moment by moment, on the balance between the activities of the kinases that phosphorylate it and the phosphatases that dephosphorylate it. Many of the switch proteins controlled by phosphorylation are themselves protein kinases, and these are often organized into phosphorylation cascades. One protein kinase activated by phosphorylation phosphorylates the next protein kinase in the sequence, and so on, transmitting the sig signal onward and, in the process, amplifying, distributing, and modulating it. Two main types of protein kinases operate in intracellular signaling pathways. The most common are serine threonine kinases, which, as the name implies, phosphorylate proteins on serines or threonines. Others are tyrosine kinases, which phosphorylate proteins on tyrosines. The other main class of switch proteins involved in intracellular signaling pathways is the GTP binding proteins. These switch between an active and an inactive state depending on whether they have GTP or GDP bound to them, respectively. Figure 1614b. Once activated by GTP binding, these proteins have intrinsic GTP hydrolysing GTPase activity, and they shut themselves off by hydrolyzing their bound GTP to GDP. One class of GTP activated switch proteins contains the large trimeric GTP binding proteins, also called G proteins that relay messages from G-protein-coupled receptors, as we discuss in detail shortly. Cell surface receptors fall into three main classes. All cell surface receptor proteins bind to an extracellular signal molecule and transduce its message into one or more intracellular signaling molecules that alter the cell's behavior. These receptors, however, are divided into three large families that differ in the transduction mechanism they use. 1. Ion channel coupled receptors allow a flow of ions across the plasma membrane, which changes the membrane potential and produces an electrical current. 2. G protein coupled receptors activate membrane bound trimeric GTP binding proteins. G proteins, which then activate either an enzyme or an ion channel in the plasma membrane, initiating a cascade of other effects. Figure 1615b. 3. Enzyme coupled receptors either act as enzymes or associate with enzymes inside the cell. Figure 1615c. When stimulated, the enzymes activate a variety of intracellular signaling pathways. The number of different types of receptors in each of these three classes is even greater than the number of extracellular signals that act on them, because for many extracellular signal molecules, there is more than one type of receptor. Moreover, some signal molecules bind to receptors in more than one class. 
The neurotransmitter acetylcholine, for example, acts on skeletal muscle cells via an ion channel coupled receptor, whereas in heart muscle cells it acts through a G protein coupled receptor. These two types of receptors generate different intracellular signals and thus enable the two types of muscle cells to react to acetylcholine in different ways, increasing contraction in skeletal muscle and decreasing the rate and force of contractions in heart. See figure 16.5a and c. The multitude of different cell surface receptors that the body requires for signaling purposes also serve as targets for many foreign substances that interfere with our physiology and sensations, from heroin and nicotine to tranquilizers and chili peppers. These substances either mimic the natural ligand for a receptor occupying the normal ligand binding site or bind to the receptor at some other site, either blocking or overstimulating the receptor's natural activity. Many drugs and poisons act in this way. Table 62. And a large part of the pharmaceutical industry is devoted to the search for substances that will exert a precisely defined effect by binding to a specific type of cell surface receptor. Ion channel coupled receptors convert chemical signals into electrical ones. Of all the types of cell surface receptors, Ion channel coupled receptors, also known as transmitter gated ion channels, function in the simplest and most direct way. These receptors are responsible for the rapid transmission of signals across synapses in the nervous system. They transduce a chemical signal in the form of a pulse of neurotransmitter delivered to the outside of the target cell directly into an electrical signal in the form of a change in voltage across the target cell's plasma membrane. See figure 1242. When the neurotransmitter binds, this type of receptor alters its conformation so as to open or close an ion channel in the plasma membrane, allowing the flow of specific types of ions, such as Na+, K+, Ca2+, or Cl-. See figure 1615a and movie 16.1. Driven by their electrochemical gradients, the ions rush into or out of the cell, creating a change in the membrane potential within a millisecond or so. This change in potential may trigger a nerve impulse or make it easier or harder for other neurotransmitters to do so. As we discuss later, the opening of CA2 plus channels has additional important effects as changes in the intracellular CA2 plus concentration can profoundly alter the activities of many CA2 plus responsive proteins in the cell. The function of ion channel coupled receptors is discussed in great detail, greater detail in chapter 12. Whereas ion channel coupled receptors are a specialty of the nervous system and of other electrically excitable cells such as muscle cells, G protein coupled receptors and enzyme coupled receptors are used by practically every cell type in the body. Most of the remainder of this chapter deals with these two receptor families and with the signal transduction processes that they use. G protein coupled receptors G-protein coupled receptors, GPCRs, form the largest family of cell surface receptors. There are more than 700 GPCRs in humans and mice have about 1,000 concerned with the sense of smell alone. These receptors mediate responses to an enormous diversity of extracellular signal molecules, including hormones, local mediators, and neurotransmitters. The signal molecules are as varied in structure as they are in function. They can be proteins, small peptides, or derivatives of amino acids or fatty acids. And for each one of them, there is a different receptor or set of receptors. Because GPCRs are involved in such a large variety of cellular processes, they are an attractive target for the development of drugs to treat a great variety, to treat a variety of disorders. About half of all known drugs work through GPCRs. 
Despite the diversity of the signal molecules that bind to them, all GPCRs that have been analyzed have a similar structure. Each is made of a single polypeptide chain that threads back and forth across the lipid bilayer seven times. Figure 1616. This superfamily of seven pass transmembrane receptor proteins includes rhodopsin, the light activated photoreceptor protein in the vertebrate eye, the olfactory smell receptors in the vertebrate nose, and the receptors that participate in the mating rituals of single yeast cell yeast. See Figure 161. Evolutionarily speaking, GPCRs are ancient. Even bacteria possess structurally similar membrane proteins, such as the bacteria dopsin that functions as a light-driven H plus pump. See figure 1128. Although they resembled eukaryotic GPCRs, these bacterial receptors do not act through G proteins. Instead, they are coupled to other signal transduction systems. Stimulation of GPCRs activates G protein subunits. When an extracellular signal molecule binds to a GPCR, the receptor protein undergoes a conformational change that enables it to activate a G protein located on the underside of the plasma membrane. To explain how this activation leads to the transmission of a signal, we must first consider how G proteins are constructed and how they function. There are several varieties of G proteins. Each is specific for a particular set of receptors and a particular set of target enzymes or ion channels in the plasma membrane. All of these G proteins, however, have a similar general structure and operate in a similar way. They are composed of three protein subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma, two of which are tethered to the plasma membrane by short lipid tails. In the unstimulated state, the alpha subunit has GDP bound to it, and the G protein is idle. Figure 1617a. When an extracellular ligand binds to its receptor, the altered receptor activates a G protein by causing the alpha subunit to decrease its affinity for GDP which is then exchanged for a molecule of GTP. In some cases, this activation is thought to break up the G protein subunits so that the activated alpha subunit, clutching its GTP, detaches from the beta gamma complex, which is also activated. Figure 1617b. Regardless of whether they, they dissociate, the two activated parts of a G protein the alpha subunit and the beta gamma complex can both interact directly with target proteins in the plasma membrane, which in turn may relay the signal to yet, to yet other destinations in the cell. The longer these target proteins have an alpha or a beta gamma subunit bound to them, the stronger and more prolonged the, relay signal, the relayed signal will be. The amount of time that the alpha and beta gamma subunits remain switched on and hence available to relay signals is limited by the behavior of the alpha subunit. The alpha subunit has an intrinsic GTPase activity, and it eventually hydrolyzes its bound GTP back to GDP, returning the whole G protein to its original inactive conformation. Figure 1618. GTP hydrolysis and inactivation occur within seconds after the G protein has been activated. The inactive G protein is now ready to be reactivated by another activated receptor. The G protein switch demonstrates a general principle of cell signaling mentioned earlier. The mechanisms that shut a signal off are as important as the mechanisms that turn it on. See figure 1614b. The shutoff mechanisms also offer as many opportunities for control and as many dangers for mishap. Take cholera for example. The disease is caused by a bacterium that multiplies in the intestine, where it produces a protein called cholera toxin. 
This protein enters the cells that line the intestine and modifies the alpha subunit of a particular G protein, called G subscript S, because it stimulates the enzyme adenyl cyclase, which we discussed shortly, in such a way that it can no longer hydrolyze its bound GTP. The altered alpha subunit thus remains in the active state indefinitely, continuously transmitting a signal to its target proteins. In intestinal cells, this causes a prolonged and excessive outflow of Cl- and water into the gut, resulting in catastrophic diarrhea and dehydration. The condition often leads to death unless urgent steps are taken to replace the lost water and ions. A similar situation occurs in whooping cough, pertussis, a common respiratory infection against which infants are now routinely vaccinated. In this case, the disease-causing bacterium colonizes the lung, where it produces a protein called pertussis toxin. This protein alters the alpha subunit of a different type of G protein, called G subscript I, because it inhibits adenyl adenylyl cyclase. In this case, however, modification by the toxin disables the G protein by locking it into its inactive GDP-bound state. Inhibiting G subscript I, like activating G subscript S, results in the generation of a prolonged inappropriate signal that in this case stimulates coughing. Both the diarrhea-producing effects of cholera toxin and the cough-provoking effects of pertussis toxin help the disease-causing bacteria move from host to host. Some G proteins directly regulate ion channels. The target proteins recognized by G protein subunits are either enzymes or ion channels in the plasma membrane. There are about 20 types of mammalian G proteins each activated by a particular set of cell surface receptors and dedicated to activating a particular set of target proteins. In this way, binding of an extracellular signal molecule to a GPCR leads to changes in the activities of a specific subset of the possible target proteins in the plasma membrane, leading to a response that is appropriate for that signal and that type of cell. We look first at an example of direct G protein regulation of ion channels. The heartbeat in animals is controlled by two sets of nerves. One speeds the heart up, the other slows it, slows it down. The nerves that signal a slowdown in heartbeat do so by releasing acetylcholine, which binds to a GPCR on the surface of the heart muscle cells. This GPCR activates the G protein G subscript I. In this case, the beta gamma complex is the active signaling component. It binds to the intracellular face of a K plus channel in the plasma membrane of the heart muscle cell, forcing the ion channel into an open conformation. Figure 1619a. This allows K plus to flow out of the cell, thereby inhibiting the cell's electrical excitability. Figure 1619b. The signal is shut off and the K plus channel recloses. When the alpha subunit inactivates itself by hydrolyzing its bound GTP, returning the G protein to its inactive state. Some G proteins activate membrane bound enzymes. When G proteins interact with ion channels, they cause an immediate change in the state and behavior of the cell. Their interactions with enzymes have more complex consequences, leading to the production of additional intracellular signaling molecules. The two most frequent target enzymes for G proteins are adenylyl cyclase, the enzyme responsible for production of the small intracellular signaling molecule, cyclic AMP, and phospholipase C the enzyme responsible for production of the small intracellular signaling molecules inositol trisphosphate and diacylglycerol. The two enzymes are activated by different types of G proteins, so that cells are able to couple the production of the small intracellular signaling molecules 
to different extracellular signals. As we saw earlier, the coupling may be either stimulatory or inhibitory. We concentrate here on G proteins that stimulate enzyme activity. The small intracellular signaling molecules generated in these cascades are often called small messengers or second messengers, the first messengers being the extracellular signals. They are produced in large numbers when a membrane-bound enzyme, such as ad adenylocyclase or phospholipase C, is activated, and they rapidly diffuse away from their source, spreading the signal. Figure 1620. Different small messenger molecules, of course, produce different responses. We first examine the consequences of an increase in the intracellular concentration of cyclic AMP. This will take us al along one of the main types of signaling pathways that lead from the activation of GPCRs. We then discuss the actions of inositol trisphosphate and diacylglycerol small messenger molecules that will lead us along a different signaling route. The cyclic AMP pathway can activate enzymes and turn on genes. Many extracellular signals acting via GPCRs affect the activity of the enzyme adenyl adenylocyclase and thus alter the conformation of the small messenger molecule cyclic AMP inside the cell. Most commonly, the activated G protein alpha subunit switches on the adenylocyclase, causing a dramatic and sudden increase in the synthesis of cyclic AMP from ATP, which is always present in the cell. Because it stimulates the cyclase, this G protein is called G subscript S. To help terminate the signal, a second enzyme called cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase rapidly converts cyclic AMP to ordinary AMP. Figure 1621. One way that caffeine acts as a stimulant is by inhibiting this phosphodiesterase in the nervous system, blocking cyclic AMP degradation and thereby keeping the concentration of this small messenger high. Cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase is continuously active inside the cell. Because it breaks cyclic AMP down so quickly, the concentration of this small messenger can change rapidly in response to extracellular signals, rising or falling tenfold in a matter of seconds. Figure 1622. Cyclic AMP is a water-soluble molecule, so it can, in some cases, carry the signal throughout the cell, traveling from the site of the membrane where it is synthesized to interact with proteins located in the cytosol, in the nucleus, or on other organelles. Cyclic AMP exerts most of its effects by activating the enzyme cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, PKA. This enzyme is normally held inactive in a complex with another protein. The binding of cyclic AMP forces a conformational change that unleashes the active kinase. Activated PKA then catalyzes the phosphorylation of particular serines or threonines on certain intracellular proteins, thus altering the activity of the proteins. In different cell types, different sets of proteins are available to be phosphorylated, which largely explains why the effects of cyclic AMP vary within the type of vary with the type of target cell. Many types of cell responses are mediated by cyclic AMP. A few are listed in Table 16.3. As the table shows, different target cells respond very differently to extracellular signals that change intracellular cyclic AMP concentrations. When we are frightened or excited, for example, the adrenal gland releases the hormone adrenaline, which circulates in the bloodstream and binds to a class of GPCRs called adrenergic receptors that are present on many types of cells. The consequences vary from one cell type to another, but all of the cell responses help prepare the body for sudden action. In skeletal muscle, for instance, 
Adrenaline triggers arise in the intracellular concentration of cyclic AMP, which causes the breakdown of glycogen, the polymerized storage form of glucose. It does so by activating PKA, which leads to both the activation of an enzyme that promotes glycogen breakdown, figure 1623, and the inhibition of an enzyme that drives glycogen synthesis. By stimulating glycogen breakdown and inhibiting its synthesis, the increase in cyclic AMP maximizes the amount of glucose available as fuel for anticipated muscular activity. Adrenal adrenaline also acts on fat cells, stimulating the breakdown of triacylglycerols, the storage form of fat to fatty acids, an immediately usable form of fuel for ATP production discussed in chapter 13. These fatty acids can then be exported for use by other cells in need of energy. In some cases, the effects of activating a cyclic AMP cascade are rapid. In skeletal muscle, for example, glycogen breakdown occurs within seconds of adrenaline binding to its receptor. See figure 1623. In other cases, cyclic AMP Responses involve changes in gene expression that take minutes or hours to develop. See figure 16.7. In these slow responses, PKA typically phosphorylates transcription regulators that then activate the transcription of selected genes. Thus, in endocrine cells in the hypothalamus, a rise in the amount of intracellular cyclic AMP stimulates the production of somatostatin, a peptide hormone that then suppresses the release of various hormones by other cells. Similarly, an increase in cyclic AMP concentration in some neurons in the brain controls the production of proteins involved in some forms of learning. Figure 1624 illustrates a typical cyclic AMP-mediated pathway from the plasma membrane to the nucleus.